here are the main reasons that I think your testosterone is tanked. There's no particular order to these. They're all important, but I'll just enumerate them and I'll get through all of them in this podcast. Number one, remember, no order to these. Not enough calories. You're calorie restricting. That will tank your hormones. Number two, you're not getting in the sun enough. Not enough vitamin D. Number three, you're not sleeping well. We can see that in your blood work. I'll tell you how to tell if you're not sleeping enough and that's affecting your testosterone and hormones negatively. Number four, your cortisol is too high, which can be a result of not sleeping or it can be a result of stress or other traumatic experiences. Number four, your nutrition is off. You're deficient in something, whether it's saturated fat, whether it's boron or other nutrients. I will talk about that in this podcast. The takeaway there will be get meat and organs in your life. Number five or six, I lost count, is perhaps you're eating too much fiber and that can definitely affect your hormones negatively. Number seven, let's just say, polyunsaturated fatty acids. I harp on this all the time, but there's good evidence that polyunsaturated fatty acids like seed oils may negatively affect your hormones. Yes, I said it and I will keep saying it. Last but not least, a ketogenic diet, a diet deficient in carbohydrates, in my opinion, can raise your SHBG, can raise your sex hormone binding globulin and cause your free bioavailable testosterone to decrease. So I will break down all of this. I will show you the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. So all the hormones and the names make sense here, but that is the overview. If you correct all of those things, I can almost guarantee your testosterone will increase. You will feel better. Or if you're a woman, your progesterone, your estrogen will increase, et cetera. And overarching all of that is that if as a result of any of those things or processed foods, processed sugar, you are insulin resistant, that will also completely mess up your hormones without a doubt. So before we dive into a number of these causes and papers that I have to support my assertion that these causes are relevant for low testosterone, I want to talk about the endocrine axis for this hormone. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you will see this graphic. If you are not, then I will try to explain it to you verbally. So you have in the brain, a region of the brain called the hypothalamus, which produces a substance called GNRH. GNRH signals to the anterior pituitary. There's a posterior and anterior pituitary, but in the anterior pituitary, there are two signaling molecules, two hormones released that travel through the body and end up in male's testicles or in women's ovaries or throughout the body of both men and women. These are LH and FSH, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Now, these have different effects uh, at different places in the testicles. As you can see in this graphic, which is a little more um, complex, the gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus goes to uh, the pituitary and you have GNRH, which is uh, more GNRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone, FSH and LH. FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, makes sense, goes to the Sertoli cells in the testicles and stimulates follicles, which become sperm, <laughs> spermatids, Spermatogenesis, it makes sperm. So FSH is stimulating the production of sperm through the Sertoli cells, from the Sertoli cells, in the seminiferous tubules, in your testicles. It does a little bit different things in women, but I can talk about that in a future podcast. LH, luteinizing hormone, goes to the Leydig cells around the seminiferous tubules, and that is where the testosterone is created. You can see here in this graphic, the testosterone can be converted to estrogen and that all of these hormones, testosterone, estrogen, and uh, inhibin produced by the Sertoli cells as a result of FSH feed back negatively at different parts of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. This is how many hormones work. If they are high, they feed back and you can see the releasing hormones or the precursor hormones going down so that the body has this natural balance. In more detail, here is a picture of the seminiferous tubules. These are in the testicles. So yes, if you are eating bull testicles or you are taking whole package from hardened soil, you are getting all of this in the seminiferous tubules of a bull. But there are many nutrients in here that can be valuable, including the testosterone produced by the uh, Leydig cells out here and all of the other cofactors, et cetera, which is probably why we eat testicles and why we find nutrients in them and benefit for both men and women and evolutionarily or historically why both men and women have consumed these. But you can see that there is a seminiferous tubule here. The Sertoli cells are here. The spermatids are here. As we remember from earlier, FSH is going to the Sertoli cells being involved in the formation of spermatogenesis, that is sperm. LH is going to the Leydig cells. And from there, we are getting testosterone produced in the testicles. Just so that everyone is familiar with the process of hormonal interconversion, I wanna show steroidogenesis briefly. 
Though this graphic looks complicated, I think it's important to see the steroid backbone here. So if we look at the formation of steroid hormones, what we are talking about there is a steroid backbone, which is in fact derived from cholesterol. <laughs> the body makes cholesterol, dietary cholesterol, yet this molecule is demonized, even though it's essential for steroid hormone production. So at the top or the beginning of the steroid hormone synthesis pathway, we have pregnenolone, depending which enzymes you use on this steroid backbone molecule of pregnenolone, you can go to progesterone, or you can go to 17-hydroxypregnenolone, and you can see that these molecules have different precursor fates. If you go down the path, 17-hydroxypregnenolone to dihydroepiandrosterone, which is DHEA, to androstenedione, then you will eventually end up in testosterone, which can then be converted to dihydrotestosterone from 5-alpha reductase or to estrogen derivatives with aromatase, and you can see that happening here. So oftentimes when people take exogenous testosterone, they will aromatize that and increase their estrogen when they often don't want to, though estrogen is important in both men and women and completely eliminating estrogen in a man can lead to massively bad effects. Regardless, sometimes people who are taking exogenous testosterone will take aromatase inhibitors because they want to limit this conversion. Whether or not that is a wise thing is hotly debated. Further up on this steroid hormone synthesis pathway, you can see that if you take pregnenolone across to progesterone, you can then end up at deoxycorticosterone and aldosterone, corticosterone, which are in fact mineralocorticoids and involved in the preservation and maintenance of electrolytes, not so much sex steroid hormones like testosterone, estradiol, et cetera. So this is the way many of the hormones are interconverted and connected. There are many different enzymes here. It is complex, but it is important to understand that testosterone and estrogens, estrone, estradiol, estriol, are all connected via simple reactions that you can inhibit or um, increase those reactions to move these around. But ultimately, many of the androgens, that is androstenedione, dione uh, androstene diol, testosterone, dihydrotestosterone have androgenic effects, and they can almost all end up being converted to the estrogens if you are getting too much of them, usually from the exogenous conversion pathways.